So uh, thank you all for being here, and welcome to our third annual um, Honors Symposium. I am Georgia Lindsay. I'm the director of the Honors Program, and I am so excited that you all came out today to see and ask very good questions about four fabulous projects. From We have some extraordinary students. I just wanted to give you a little context about the Honors Program so that you know where they are in the process. Um, the students apply for the Honors Program in the spring of their junior year, and they have to meet stringent GPA requirements and have an intellectually interesting topic that faculty is willing to support. And they work with three faculty throughout the, the entirety of their senior year on developing a, a project of their choosing into what you see today. So they spent the fall in a class where we talked about research methods and scholarship broadly, and how to fit their work into what has already been done. And then they've spent the uh, Christmas break and spring semester really working hard on developing their individual projects further. They are not done with their process. So um, they are mostly done, but what you are seeing today is in progress work that is aiming towards final, but, but probably not quite done because they have two to three to maybe four weeks until their defense dates. And that's when they get together, when they give, us, give their committees their final projects, and um, we sit in a room together and ask them all kinds of very difficult questions. So thank you all for being here. I hope you will ask them questions to help them practice thinking on their feet and defending their work. So without further ado, um, I would like to introduce Olivia Flynn, who will be talking about designing green learning. Good morning, everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Olivia Flynn, and this is a look at designing green learning. So this project explores how learning spaces can educate the building users about the environment. As green design continues to be one of the fastest growing fields in the world, the intersection of green school design and environmental education becomes more critical. It is my intention to produce a design-based understanding of how, how learning spaces can be created to influence environmental education. This has the potential to contribute positive change in how education spaces are imagined in respect to the environments that surround them. I want everyone to think about the last place that they felt like they learned something. Where was it? Was it in your kitchen, or in a big lecture hall, or in an intimate moment with a friend in a museum? Wherever that is for you, I want you to take the post-it notes at the end of each aisle and do a quick sketch. If you can't think of the last place that you learned, think of a memorable place that you have learned. And don't stress too much about the aesthetic quality of your drawing. It's a quick sketch, and only the large population of designers in the room are judging you. As we wrap those up, I want you to think about the last place that you were captivated by nature. Where's the last place that you felt like you learned from nature or you learned about it? And on your next post-it note, I want you to do a quick sketch of that.
So now, next, I want you to take a look at your first drawing, take a look at your second drawing, and on a third post-it note, do your best to combine the two. So was it hard? Is your new drawing abstract, or was it already combined? When we break it down like this, it feels like something that should be a fluid combination. In fact, the connection between learning spaces and nature is too often distant. A large body of research and literature supports this notion of a fluid combination. Books such as Richard Lou's Last Child in the Woods have urged its audience that children are actually suffering from nature deficit disorder or the US government has increased spending on greening schools by $7 billion. And EMVD's own Louise Chala contributes new knowledge and conducts studies that progress the field each year. Countless studies born from environmental psychology, architecture, education, and other fields have indicated that connecting humans, and for the purpose of my research, I'm talking about the tiny humans, with nature contributes to health benefits, heightened creativity, positive relationships to learning, and subsequently place. Looking specifically at the intersection between architecture, design, and environmental education has brought me to look at a few particular scholars whose knowledge sits at this intersection. The first of these is Laura Cole, who is a leading researcher in a philosophy called Teaching Green Buildings. This is an emergent building typology, which encompasses learning spaces in which, through architectural features, the building user becomes aware of and engaged with their environment. Cole explains that there are four design strategies to teaching green buildings, or TGB. These typologies are factual information, physical engagement, social interaction, and social norms. As I go through these design strategies, feel free to sketch on your post-it notes if you feel that your drawing is encompassed by one of these strategies. Perhaps it's not, but perhaps it will be. And during the Q&A, my lovely advisor, Shaheen, will come around and collect them so I can explore these ideas a little further as I carry out the rest of my research. Factual information is a way of explicitly stating how the building or the environment or the site addresses the environment. So this could be an interactive touch screen or a visual overlay on an architectural element, any text-based intervention. Physical engagement is designed that promotes hands-on learning and interaction. Excellent examples of this would be a vegetable garden in a school where learners dire directly interact with the earth. Social interaction is a way of organizing the space as a venue for interaction, exploring, and learning. So the space's layout encourages this unplanned interaction with the environment. This type of design is really common in Montessori or Reggio Emilia type schools. Social norms is a type of design where the individual is viewed as a person participating in social patterns. So the environment sets up a social culture in which the entire channel of information is set up by the learner. So these design strategies really intrigued me, and I began to wonder about the social implications for sustainable behavior. Given the scope of this pro project, rather than working directly with the children in the space, I decided to pair this philosophy with another framework, emerging out of product design. This framework, by Dr. Lyle and Dr. Wilson, explores how the design of certain products can influence behavior in a more sustainable manner. For the purpose of my research, products and places will be categorized as informing, persuading, or determining sustainable behaviors. Informing design interventions make users aware of an environmental action that they could take, while persuading design aims to push participants towards a certain type of behavior. And determining design entails designing spaces and products that essentially limit the participant to a sustainable behavior. I have taken these different design frameworks into five different learning spaces. Data collection has come from site visits led by a field guide looking for architectural, spatial, and site elements that speak to these frameworks we just spoke about. 
This paired with guiding observations about the space, photographing, sketching, note-taking has given me a robust set of observation. These observations have then been supplemented with interviews of administration at each space. The case study slides that I have selected are all learning spaces with a focus on environmental education, ranging in degrees of formality from a repurposed warehouse serving as a community center to a Denver public neighborhood school. I have chosen a range in formality to look, take a look at the difference in design strategies employed in interest-based learning spaces versus curriculum and forced learning spaces. In reviewing the analysis and coding the supporting interviews I have already completed, I'm beginning to find some patterns across the design strategies, sustainable behavior design methods, and the degree of formality within each space. So this image shows uh, the design frameworks mapped across the space of the grow house, which is the most informal of my case studies. The grow house exists in a warehouse repurposed, driven to sow sustainable food and lifestyle behaviors into the surrounding community through education and engagement. Now this image shows a plan view of the Odyssey School, which is a charter school in Denver. The Odyssey School has a curricular focus on sustainable education, but their architectural space was handed down to them from a previously existing neighborhood school without this focus. Given the spatial constraints at the Odyssey School, the school takes students out of the building and into natural spaces to encourage this kind of connection and learning with the natural world. This ranges from fourth graders camping and biking in Moab for a week to kindergartners staying in Spruce Grove for the night. Looking across these two spaces, the more informal space, the grow house, has a high cluster and a dynamic range of these design strategies and sustainable behavior methods. The space also has a higher cluster of social normative and social interactive spaces, while the Odyssey space alone has a smaller number of these map strategies. When supplemented with the outdoor excursion, they're able to get a little bit closer to this dynamic range and include those social normative and social interactive spaces. The first indication that I've pulled from this analysis is a relationship between the TGB design strategies and Dr. Lyleen Wilson's design for sustainable behavior spectrum. So far, the four design elements seem to map up across the spectra spectrum with factual information design methods primarily informing sustainable behaviors, physical engagement and social interaction, mostly persuading towards sustainable behaviors, and social norm normative spaces determining sustainable behaviors. Secondly, I found that the degree of formality maps across this nearly connected framework. So the more formal spaces tend to employ the design strategies of factual information and physical engagement, while more informal spaces, though able to enact each strategy, tend to be more robust in areas of social interaction and social norms. This preliminary insight indicates that due to numerous variables, including spatial limitations and budgetary constraints to change those spatial limitations and a larger curriculum fo focus, spaces on the more formal end of the spectrum tend to employ these first two design strategies because their space is able to facilitate them more fluidly. To achieve the latter two design strategies, spaces move out of their teaching green building into a teaching green space, or another space where learning through exploration and sustainable behavior as a social norm becomes more accessible. So, for example, at the Odyssey School, it is in the realm of possibility to create signage and mur murals that educates about recycling and have recycling bins, while this kind of unplanned exploration and connection cannot spark within their given architectural space. So I believe that this project positions itself to contribute to further possibilities. The notion of teaching green building, buildings is an emergent but established building typology, which has a greater aim to inform school designers on how they can use architecture to facilitate environmental connection with their learners. In its preliminary stages, this research indicates that teaching green spaces may be an addition to the building typology or a spatial typology aimed to inform school designers in the physical and pedagogical space on how space, perhaps beyond architecture, can be used to facilitate this connection. Beyond this insight, I believe that this research is positioned for further research, design, and knowledge creation. I intend to publish a print publication, including a graphic language, photographs, and a deeper exploration of this research, aimed to make this knowledge accessible to a large audience and ignite paradigms that believe in the critical nature of creating positive relations between space, learning, and nature. 
Thank you all for listening. I would love to explore any questions that this has ignited in anyone at this time. <laughs> Process, a series of steps or actions taken in order to achieve a particular end. A quick Google search will show that the design process is defined in many different ways and varies from um, different disciplines of design, but usually tend to have elements of a cyclical um, nature or a linear nature of step-by-step -step processes. Um, here in envi environmental design, um, the common design process that's taught um, begins with identifying a problem and then moving forward to precedent research, um, site analysis, an iterative design phase, and um, then the design refinement, moving into a final design, and then possibly fabrication or construction. Um, but as, it's, as it is today, the software um, and technology, as well as hardware integration in the system, tends to be heavily on the back end of this design process typically used in either the fabrication stage or um, in some sort of software system that's used to develop a 3D model that would say um, then produce drawings for the construction phase. Um, and this process is sort of due to the nature of the field of architecture that is still employing uh, centuries old building techniques, um, a property market that avoids risk, and sort of the weight of the historic and semantic considerations that um, block sort of the evolution of this design moving forward uh, to integrate technology in a way that you might see in the automotive or aeronautical industries. And so I'm proposing a less stable and a more intimate design process um, that moves the role of the designer from creating this ideal end product to creating a responsive and almost pure science uh, design process. Um, the role of the designer shifts from pure conception of the final design to the designer of these embedded systems where um, each step generates designs and will inherently produce new designs um, that were once maybe uh, unimaginable. Um, so in the proposed design process, each step sort of features a spectrum of use of technology, both in software and in hardware, and then also the role of the designer is integrated into that spectrum. Um, so the, the site analysis uh, sort of drives the problem identification and vice versa. Um, and then that drives the larger steps of the placement, the material composition, the structure and the form, the embedded systems within the design, um, and then the responsive fabrication. And this is continually processing and adapting based on what this system picks up. So for my thesis design project, um, I sort of started on the technology side, which was something that was completely new for me, um, working with my advisor, Ariel, from TAM, to learn about mi microcontrollers um, in Arduino, which is a commonly used um, microcontroller and uh, open source software platform. Um, and I developed a module that collects audio data um, and records it to an SD card. And then I created a whole army of these, and. Uh, place them around the SYNC facility, which is our um, program center for innovation and creativity, creative labs. Um, and so I sort of located them throughout the space, varying from the computer lab and the classroom to the studio spaces and even the wood shop. And began collecting data. Uh, it collects um, a, a um, data point for every second, um, and that sort of gave me a lot more data than I expected, and uh, <laughs> working through the process um, using Grasshopper to even create something like this from that text file was a process in and of itself that I wasn't exactly ready for. Um, but then sort of creating these visualizations that begin to show um, and represent that data and how it varies from the wood shop to a classroom where I think some of my friends actually uh, messed with the data there. Um, and then to some of the studio spaces. Um, and then sort of moving into what that looks like in 3D, there's some 3D prints in the back um, that also start to display this data. Uh, but moving forward with this project, I'd really like to develop a system and use um, the module I've created to um, create a more responsive um, interface, whether that be 3D or visual that actually filters the data and responds so that um, this can start to be uh, something that could potentially be scaled up to an architectural level and maybe 
um, serve as a facade system or a wall system in a room that would respond to the sound qualities. And I've sort of been inspired by some of these precedent studies. This is a project called Point Cloud out of Harvard GSD that responds to weather data using servo motors and also a microcontroller similarly to what I'm working with. Um, this is a project out of MIT's Mediated Matter Lab um, called the Silk Pavilion where they actually tracked the patterns of silkworms and then using CNC uh, weaving created a platform of these structures and then released thousands of silkworms onto the structure weaving a dome installation. And this is a really cool example of how technologists, scientists, and architects can all work together. And then this is a project out of IAC in Barcelona called uh, Material, and it's uh, an anti-gravity form structure using ceramics and a robotics arm. And so with these projects, while they're at small scale, you can start to see how with the future, um, in the future, they can be scaled up and respond at a building level scale. Um, so if we have, as designers, look to our tools with new curiosities and sensibilities of authorship, not purely imitating nature, but emulating their govern its governing principles, it gives us the framework to move across scales and disciplines to design, design responsive systems that have the potential to tackle the wicked problems of the future. Hello, good afternoon. My project is called Dynamic Modular Housing. Today's homes look very similar to these, static. What I mean by this is a static home may change over time, but it's a very slow process. It can be expensive, it can be a nuisance, dealing with permits, construction zones, inconvenience while you're living in the home that's being remodeled. Sometimes the building has conditions as well, limits and, and possibilities to alterations. However, I believe we can design a home that can change more frequently while addressing the needs of the inhabitants. The current condition and problems of the traditional static homes are dealing with the size of the home while your family expands, the expense and cost of buying multiple homes over the timeline of the family, and the fixed location of the home and lack of movement within it. Lastly, the limitations of the home to articulate, articulate and change can be problematic. Our lives are dynamic, so we should live in a space. So why should we live in a space that limits what we can do within them? Why shouldn't we define our inhabitable space ourselves? Rather, the inhabitants need to determine the function that's being taken place in that space. Say for instance, you're a small family, just met the love of your life, and you're trying to start off anew. So there you are. You have to figure out what to do, right? So what do you do? You buy a house, right? Same thing for a growing family. What do you do? Your apartment's getting a little small. Also, life happens, so scenarios change. Sometimes it's not all good. So if you have, if you have problems with your partner and you find that you're gonna have a divorce, what if you could split up your house? What if you were caring for an elderly loved one and you needed to add more space to your house? A dynamic modular home provides a means to utilize an additive and subtractive process of altering the home. 
The home can now be split up if necessary to accommodate various life situations. The self-sustainable capacity of the home makes it more appealing, totally self-sufficient and independent. Utilizing an open floor plan with large foldable glazy walls allows the outdoors in, thus creating the possibilities for grand views and a sense of a larger space inside of a compact dwelling. The adaptability for expansion, not only horizontally, but also vertically, provides inhabitants more possibilities. What I have learned from others. I am not the first person to try this or address this problem. Here are some others, and here's the way that they went about it. Le Corbusier created United de Habitation and focused on the concept of changing different floor plans with the same building and creating various configurations of that same floor plan within that small space. Buckminster Fuller worked on the Wichita House, an inventive way of utilizing the natural surroundings and incorporating them functionally within the home itself. The VIP shelter, a small all-inclusive dwelling, it was created with industrial technology in a factory. The purpose was for incorporating the natural environment with the built environment. It was created as a means for the people within the city to retreat and get away from the hustle and bustle. Blue homes. They have been creating homes that encompass an elegance in the procession of unfolding from a basic shipping container size into a new basic pop-up house. And lastly, I looked at the Hive House, which I was fascinated with. The creative ways the walls articulate in order to create new and different spaces for the inhabitants. So looking at dynamic homes, I started playing with solids and voids, creating little foam modules, little cores, connecting them all together, finding different variations that they would connect, and basically different programs that were kind of interesting. So I chose to utilize the solids as a representation of the dwellings, and I chose to use the voids as representations of where the natural surroundings should be introduced into the home. The solids also took shape in creating overhangs to limit sunlight into the inhabitant's dwelling. The voids also created pretty awesome patios. The new concepts I came up with were the core, the utility umbilical, the movable bearing walls, instituting the creator and the inhabitant to come together in unison in creating a home, and modulating floor and roof systems. The core. The contents are not only the heart of the system, it also provides the, and stores the necessities for the dwelling. It also has various functions. These functions include HVAC systems, water collection, possible reverse osmosis systems, components, stairs, elevators, depending on the inhabitants, limitations, and lastly, a crane to help assemble the building itself. The HVA system uses a zoning delivery system that keeps this home comfortable even in the dead of winter or in the peak of summer. 
A Tesla power wall contains the required energy for the building. A reverse osmosis system, similar to the International Space Station's, is in place to filter and help with um, and help with potable water and also gray water. While the water collection system is used on the roof to capture rain and snow for the building's use. Depending on the needs of the inhabitants, stairs or elevators can be incorporated. Say, for instance, you've reached that age where it's no longer easy for you to go up and down stairs. Why not have an elevator? Or maybe you don't even need a second floor. Lastly, the crane will provide a, the crane in the core will provide help for assembling the building itself. The utility umbilical distributes the utilities throughout the space. This is an, an artery, a nervous system of the home. The utility of the umbilical provides the lifeline for the utilities throughout the space. This ranges from HVAC ductwork to the power supply, from the core to the modules, and vice versa. Also, waste and water to and from. The ball bearing wall provides a way the ball bearing wall provides a way to move and articulate and support the roof structure while creating different spaces and rooms within the structure itself. These run on our predetermined channel on the interior. This also allows pivoting for ease for the inhabitant to maneuver throughout the space to configure for various situations, such as a party, maybe you need more space. The homeowner, can, the homeowner can now modify the rooms as they wish. This becomes extremely helpful, especially if you need to downsize. Involving the homeowner, the homeowner provides them with the knowledge in case a problem should arise. The floor and ceiling systems needed somewhat of a compact size, lightweight. They also needed a way that the platforms could become rigid and safe. The owner can either hand crank the extrusions or opt for an electric mechanism. The floor and ceiling system creates a rigid structure exemplary for this design. Configuration one showcases the various ways in, in which you can configure a module for a starting out family. Maybe you just need a bedroom a hallway, a bathroom. The open floor plan also allows for other spaces to become and appear almost from nowhere. Configuration two illustrates early concepts for articulating configurations. Configuration three also highlights a way of altering the space shown here. If ever there is any need for the module, or it becomes damaged, or anything like that, you can sell a module to somebody else. Or if it becomes damaged, you can recycle it, or even upcycle it. Thank you very much. Thank you, my project is low carbon housing. So my research question was, how can designers and engineers use embodied carbon as a design philosophy to further reduce a house's carbon footprint? And I'm sure we're all aware of climate change and the devastating effects it's having on our planet. And one of the biggest ingredients in climate change is atmospheric CO2, which is trending upwards 
and has record levels in our atmosphere. And as an architecture student, this is quite alarming to me due to the fact that buildings are responsible for almost 45% of carbon dioxide emissions, the largest industry uh, for these types of emissions. And so as a student, I began looking at the life cycle of buildings and where these carbon emissions are derived from. And they come from two different categories. There's operational emissions, which are things like lighting, HVAC systems, and then there's embodied emissions. And those are the materials and the life cycle of the building, everything except for the operational emissions. And when you put these two together, you get the houses or the building's total carbon footprint. And so in conventional buildings, historically energy levels and their energy efficiency haven't been that great. And so you see their total carbon footprint is mostly comprised of operational emissions, where embodied emissions is a very small uh, number compared to the operational emissions. So the market has responded to this. And you start to see things like LED light bulbs, energy efficient appliances, insulated glazing. You get renewable energy sources like solar and wind power. And you even have designers and engineers that introduce building information modeling software into their schematic design phases of the design. Um, and doing and using these types of software really help uh, make the building as efficient as possible and really reduce the operational carbon footprint. And you have building institutions like LEED and Living Building Challenge, ARC 2030, these popular green building institutions rewarding project teams for lowering their operational carbon footprint. And as you see here, the energy category in LEED is almost 35% of the points you're able to earn, whereas in body carbon is only at 9%. And so as these buildings begin to adopt these strategies and become more and more efficient, and we call them sustainable, we call them green, you start to see the carbon footprint shift. And the carbon footprint, it shrinks a little bit, it gets a little smaller, but embodied emissions now is the majority of the footprint. For example, in a net zero energy house, embodied emissions are going to make up 100% of the carbon footprint. But this is missing from the iterative design process. And where operational carbon informs our design decisions, embodied carbon is left out and it's often overlooked. And so for my thesis project, I wanted to take a look at how as a designer I'm able to use embodied carbon as a design philosophy and introduce it into the iterative design phase um, to get reductions uh, in the carbon footprint. So let me take you back to where it all began. And I was designing with a team for the code competition. And it's the Committee on the Environment. And so what we did is we designed a single family house. It was around 1,800 square feet. And we designed it to be as environmentally efficient as possible, which is kind of difficult in the Silverthorn climate that we were working with. Um, but we gave it our best shot. And we went with industry standards. Uh, the green building industry standards, and we started to introduce building information modeling into our design process. And as you notice, we would model, and then we would design more and model again, and try to let operational carbon um, influence our design decisions, which we did, and I think we did a really great job. And we were able to get our EUI down to 19 when everything was said and done. And here's just a little sketch of the building we designed in the schematic design phase. But for my thesis project, I wanted to take it one step further. And I wanted to look at the life cycle of the building and the embodied emissions that we, we left it on the table. We didn't really consider it as much as we should have. And we looked at materials and we looked at construction, but it wasn't informing our design decisions as operational carbon was. So I looked at materials and I looked at the entire life cycle from extraction into, from cradle to grave from beginning to end um, to try to figure out what the embodied footprint was of the building. And so I modeled the building in Revit, which is a software program. And from Revit, I was able to get the material takeoffs, the cut sheets, um, the different quantities of all the materials in the house. And I plugged that into a program called Athena. And Athena is a life cycle assessment software program. Uh, so I put the material quantities into this program. And from that, I was able to get uh, the embodied carbon per assembly. And if you see here, this is an exploded axon of the house. And on the very left are all the, 
carbon emissions um, that are embodied within these materials. And notice this is just the envelope. Uh, it was out of the scope of my project to include things like plumbing and mechanical. Uh, I was just focused on the envelope uh, for this project. And the total was 168 tons of CO2 embodied. And to put that into perspective, that's like driving a car for 32 straight years, um, which might not seem like a lot, but um, it's quite a big impact considering we were leaving it on the table before. And so it was very important to keep the square footage the same as I designed this new iteration. Um, it'd be pretty simple to go from a 1,000 square foot or an 1,800 square foot house to like a 1,500 square foot house and say, oh, the embodied carbon obviously dropped. Um, but the real challenge was keeping the square footage the exact same, um, keeping the program the same, the views the same, and not sacrificing any of the quality that we gained in the original house. And so from the Athena software program, I was able to make this pie chart of all the different assemblies that I calculated. And from this pie chart, I looked at the roof, the exterior walls, the windows, and the foundation systems. And I did some massing models. And I was able to go from a one-story building to a two-story building. And when I did this, I realized almost a 40% reduction in both the roof and the foundation, a total of 23 tons of CO2 embodied. And so I did the same thing with the roof material. And I looked at the finish of the roof. And I went from an aluminum roofing finish to an asphalt shingle finish and was able to reduce the embodied carbon by five tons of CO2. So I did the same thing with the window frame. I went from an aluminum frame to a wood frame and got almost a 50% reduction in embodied carbon, 20 tons of CO2. And so this is the new form. And over on the very left, you can see the savings of CO2. Exterior walls, we added two tons of carbon just because from going from a one story to a two story, you have to add a little material, so the embodied carbon raised a bit. And so this is them side by side, and I was able to achieve a 28% reduction in my embodied carbon footprint just with the envelope of the building from 168 to 121 tons. Um, and this is only an 1,800 square foot house. But if you think about the million homes that are built every year in America, that can be quite a significant impact on the building industry's overall carbon footprint. And this is a little image of the house and its elements up in Silverthorne. Um, and so I guess it's one of my goals for this project and in life, I guess, is to go to Home Depot someday and right next to the LED efficient light bulb, there's the LED low embodied carbon efficient light bulb. Um, that's kind of a dream of mine. And so with that, I want to thank you for listening to my project.